Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for the fourth and final session of our four-part series on Can't Win for Losing, The Crisis of the Working Poor. My name is Jill Fusen, and I am the Assistant Director at the Riley Institute at Furman, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here tonight. I'd like to begin by asking you to join me in extending a special welcome to Secretary of Education and Governor of South Carolina, Dick Riley. We have a great program for you here this evening, and I think you are going to be so glad that you are here, and we are glad that you are here. I just have four things I would like to say to you before we begin our program. And the first is just to express to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute how much the Riley Institute has enjoyed partnering to bring this series to you each year. Our emphasis is on critical issues and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute focuses on lifelong learning and that's just a really good fit. And so we have been so delighted to have had this opportunity to work with Ollie at Furman in bringing this series to you. If you don't mind, take just a minute and look at the back of your program. I just would like to point out a couple of the upcoming events at the Riley Institute, two in particular. One of them is on September the 4th, and this is Dr. Andrew Michta, and he will be coming. He is a Central and Eastern Europe expert, and he's going to be speaking about the crisis in the Ukraine and giving his views on what this means for Russia, what this means for NATO, and for the United States' relationship with Russia. So that should be really interesting to hear. And then we have our National Conference on China and the Environment, which will be September 22nd and 23rd. And we've got a great lineup of speakers for that program. And please check back to the Riley Institute website, and you'll see uh, more about that in the days ahead. The third thing I'd like to mention is many of you have requested um, additional information. You've enjoyed the PowerPoints, you've enjoyed the presentations, and you wanted to have access to them. And we do have PowerPoints on our website now that you can access from the previous sessions. And in addition, all the sessions will are being recorded and they will be available on our website. The videos will be uploaded or you can purchase a DVD through the OLLI office. So be looking for that to come in the weeks ahead. And the last thing I will mention is please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> Thank you again for coming. You are in for a treat tonight. We have some fabulous speakers who have come from as far away as Seattle, Washington, or Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, and I now invite Mark Quinn to come up and introduce the first speaker this evening. Great. Thank you very much, Jill. Good evening, everybody. Great to see a big crowd here. You know, when I left work today, about an hour and a half early, I ran into one of my colleagues and said, you know, I can't make that meeting. Got to go to Furman because I'm helping moderate a session up there. He goes, oh, that's pretty cool. What's it about? I said, well, it's about the working poor. And he looked at me and he goes, is anybody going to be there? <laughs> and he, he meant that in the best possible way. He was like, really? And I, I told him, I said, now we've been averaging crowds of about 200 people engaged and really interested in the topic. And so he took that to heart and said, well, maybe next year I will come along and see what it's all about. Remember last week, this topic for the first part of our conversation was upward, upward mobility in America. And we saw some great information from the Pew Charitable Trust about sort of this myth of the American dream for a lot of people in America who come from low income backgrounds. And I wanna just put an exclamation point on what we talked about last week because there's a new book that just came out this week. And it starts out like this, play by the rules, work hard, apply yourself and do well in school and that will open doors for you. That's what Carl Alexander writes in the opening of his book. A study he just published in June suggests that the things that really make the difference though between prison and college, success and failure, sometimes even life and death, are money and family, things we've been talking about the last three weeks. He has a new book out called The Long Shadow which explored this scenario. Take two kids of the same age who grew up in the same city, maybe even the same neighborhood. What factors will make the difference for each? So to find the answer, the Hopkins of Johns Hopkins researchers undertook this massive study. They followed nearly 800 kids in Baltimore from first grade until 30 years old. 
They found that a child's fate is in many ways fixed at birth, determined by family strength and the parent's financial status. The kids who got a better start because their parents were married and working ended up better off. Most of the poor kids from single parent families stayed poor. Here's the statistic that I think is staggering. Out of those 800 at the age of 30, how many do you think have moved up to the next income bracket? 33. 33 out of those 800 that they followed for nearly 30 years. That's it. And only 50 had some level of college education. Only about 25 had finished college out of those 800. So we talk about upward mobility. We talk about the American dream. We, it does exist for some, but it doesn't exist for all. And I just wanted to bring that to your attention. If you're inter interested in the book, uh, it is called The Long Shadow. We're going to talk about a really interesting initiative coming up in just a few minutes that's happening in Spartanburg, a real transformation in a neighborhood there that has long been impoverished, has long been in decay, but is on the way back through the Herculean efforts of an awful lot of people and people who have a lot of civic pride in their hometown. That's going to be interesting. But first, let me bring up Carol Naughton. Carol helped found Purpose Built Communities in 2008. She previously served for seven years as executive director of the East Lake Foundation, the lead nonprofit organization that developed and continues to implement a bold, innovative, and successful model of community revitalization that helps families break the cycle of poverty. Carol serves in the board of the Charles Drew Charter. She's a former president of the Georgia Association for Women's Lawyers, a member of the State Bar of Georgia, a former member of the Board of Governors for that organization as well. She serves or has served in the boards of several community and national organizations. She's a graduate of the Emory University School of Law and was executive editor of the Emory Law Journal. She graduated with honors from Colgate University. Please help me in welcoming Ms. Carol Naughton. Good evening, everybody. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Um, thank you all for coming out this evening for this conversation. And Mark, to your colleagues who are skeptical that people care about these issues, this is proof positive um, that we do care and that we are looking for solutions to some of the problems that you've been learning about through this series over the last four or five weeks. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about one of the solutions um, that we think work in helping to break the cycle of poverty in low-income neighborhoods. And, and uh, Mark, the, the study that you told me about, you know, another filter that you could put through that is the neighborhood that people live in. If you look at neighborhood statistics around the country, you find that neighborhood, your zip code, is a very accurate predictor of your life circumstances, of your life's chances. If you're born in a zip code where parents tend to be married, where incomes are high, where their schools are good, you're set, you're on a great trajectory. And if you're born in a neighborhood where the schools are poor, where the housing is poor, where um, people don't have a high income, um, you're trapped, you're, you're really trapped. And so today I'd like to tell you a story about a group of people who came together um, to try to change the dynamics of a neighborhood like that in Atlanta. And it's that model that my friends in Spartanburg have adopted as their own and are looking to try to create the same kinds of outcomes that we have. But I'd like to ground us in a little bit of common terminology as we move forward. Um, you all in this process have learned a lot about poverty over the last, um, the last few weeks. Um, as Mark was referring to, if you're born in the bottom 20% of, of the economic status in this country, 60% of you will stay there. Um, or stay in the bottom two percentages um, for the rest of your life. Um, 48 million Americans living in poverty today. 48 million, that's an enormous number. But poverty impacts kids even worse. Um, one in four American children living in poverty, and 50% of those children live in neighborhoods of concentrated poverty. And by concentrated poverty, we mean more than 30% of families in that neighborhood are below the federal poverty line. As, as flawed a measure as that may be, it's the one that we have to work with. Um, gosh, you know, I look at this statistic and I'm, I'm stunned every time. Um, it's, look, at, take a look at some of this stuff. 86%, and we're gonna come back to this, 86% of children who live in concentrated poverty can't read a grade level in third grade. That's the, that is maybe the best predictor of whether a child is going to graduate from high school. And it's also the statistic that our prison planners use 
to determine how many prison beds they're going to need 10 years down the road. We're going to come back to this statistic because there's another important issue that it ties to. Um, people who live in concentrated poverty live um, in areas where violence is typically much higher than in other neighborhoods and where twice as many people lack high school diplomas as in other communities. You've learned all this. You've seen this. Um, you're, you're learning about this in, your, in this process. Um, we spend a ton of money, or let's say we lose a ton of economic output as a result of childhood poverty in this country, over $500 billion every year in lost economic output as a result of childhood poverty. Now, this is where I usually uh, remind people that a few years ago we had something called the TARP, that big bailout that was so controversial. $700 billion once that was all going to be paid back. Here, we're losing $500 billion a year in economic output and we're never going to recapture this. Where is the outrage? We should all be up on our chairs saying, this is unacceptable as an economic situation in our country, not even getting it to the moral imperative. Social Security. When Social Security started back in the day, back in around 1940, there were almost 160 workers for every recipient of Social Security. Now there are 2.9 workers for every recipient of Social Security. When I retire at the age of 70 in 2020, there will be two workers for every recipient of Social Security. We need everyone in this country to be an effective, lifelong learner who's capable of success in a knowledge-based economy in order for our nation to be successful. We cannot leave anyone behind. So I want to tell you this story about a solution to neighborhood-based um, concentrated poverty that was first implemented in the East Lake neighborhood of Atlanta and now is being replicated across the country. Um, our approach is holistic in nature. Um, too often in neighborhood revitalizations, the housers worked on one thing or the educators worked on something else and the uh, health and wellness people were totally divorced from the conversation. So you had all these little initiatives going on and nothing would get traction and nothing would work. But in Eastlake, we took a comprehensive holistic approach that addressed both the physical needs of the community but also the human needs of the community. I recall that one of your speakers uh, discussed kind of three elements of capital that are necessary for upward mobility. Um, financial capital, human capital, and social capital. You'll see that all three of those ideas are embedded in our neighborhood transformation model. This is East Lake Meadows back in 1995. By every measure, this was a community that had ceased to provide opportunity for people. It was a place where the boys, if they were lucky enough to grow up, ended up in prison, and the girls ended up in public housing for the rest of their lives. I should point out that many people in these communities and in Eastlake worked their whole lives, but they worked at extraordinarily low-paying jobs and were never able to get enough traction together to be moving forward. Let's look at some of the statistics. Crime rate was 18 times the national average. In fact, the, the market that functioned the best in this community was the drug market. $35 million a year annual drug trade. Um, almost every family in this neighborhood was going to be the victim of a felony every single year. Think about what that means when you wake up in the morning and you think, is it my time? Is it my mom's? Is it my grandmother's? How can you concentrate on the things that you need to concentrate on in school or at work if you're worried about that kind of violence perpetrated on you and your family? Uh, in our community, uh, all the housing in this neighborhood was public housing, and almost half of the units didn't meet the very basic uh, habitability standards that HUD, HUD set forward. Uh, about 1,400 people lived in this neighborhood, and I remember the first time I went out there. I'm an old commercial real estate lawyer. Um, and so in, you know, in the 80s and 90s in Atlanta, if there was a piece of dirt, people were building on it. And the first time I went out to Eastlake, I was shocked because there was virtually a moat of undeveloped land all around the public housing community because everybody who had owned something out there had abandoned it and left. So it was a community that had suffered from both black flight and white flight. Everybody who had a, had a choice had exercised it and left creating a really unhealthy dynamic and a real sense of hopelessness for people in the community. Only 13% of people worked at this stage of the game. 
uh, average incomes were well under $4,500, and most folks were relying on welfare as their primary source of income. Public transportation was marginal. Um, if you didn't own a car, it was very difficult to get where you needed to go. Uh, if you needed to go grocery shopping, you faced a two-hour bus ride each way. There wasn't a, hadn't been a grocery store in this neighborhood in 40 years. How could we expect people to try to use this as a platform to move forward? The infrastructure simply wasn't there. We looked at the education outcomes in the community. That was the most sobering of all these, all these statistics. Uh, the school in the neighborhood was one of the lowest performing schools in the state of Georgia, with only 5% of fifth graders being able to pass the state math test. 30% of kids graduated from high school. 30% of young people were able to graduate from high school. And the reality is most of those children were not well prepared for college or career. And that may have been as big a fraud perpetrated on anybody in this community. Um, on those people who had done everything that they were told to do, but found that they were still not ready to be successful in college or career. Here's East Lake today. And what happened is a small group of people came together who said, frankly, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And these were a group of people who, led by residents who lived in the community, and Eva Davis, who is the president of the East Lake Meadows Tenants Association, the executive director of the Atlanta Housing Authority, who's named Renee Glover, who was new to this business and didn't think that we had to do things the same way it had always been done, that there had to be a better way to deliver housing in a way that could support families rather than further isolate them and push them uh, down the socioeconomic ladder. And then finally, a guy named Tom Cousins, who is a real estate developer based in Atlanta. Um, and boy, if you think people were skeptical about the housing authority saying, hi, I'm here to help, what do you see the rich white guy from Buckhead come down to the community and say, um, hi, I'm here, from, I'm here to help? Um, it took us all, and I worked at that point for the Atlanta Housing Authority as, the, as their deal lawyer. And I will tell you, um, when, I was, um, when I went to work for the housing authority, I was really excited about the idea of trying to create this new legal and financial model to do mixed income housing. But I went to a work for an agency that was really broken at the time. And one of the great things about working for a broken organization is that if you demonstrate the least little bit of talent and enthusiasm, you get to do things that you would never otherwise get to do. And so my boss walked into my office two weeks after being there, and she said, you're coming with me out to Eastlake. And I said, oh, clearly you've confused me with somebody else. I'm your deal lawyer. And she said, it doesn't matter. There's nobody else home. You're coming with me. And that changed my life. It changed it both professionally and personally by having the opportunity to be part of the community and work with the community really for the next 15 years on the revitalization of the neighborhood. But we had to build relationships. Um, the residents in the neighborhood who had frankly been left behind by all the institutions that were supposed to be supporting this neighborhood, by the city, by the school system, by churches, um, everybody had, had pushed them away. So we had to find a, a new model, and this is what we came up with. Let me show you where we are today. We had crime down 73%, um, 90% um, reduction in violent crime, one of the safest neighborhoods in the neighbor, uh, in the city. The housing now is privately managed. It's mixed income housing. Mixed income housing serves families across a broad range of incomes. So it serves people beautifully, whether you're real low income or whether you're much uh, higher income. Um, everybody's gone to work. Unless you're elderly or disabled, everyone works now in the community and they get the support they need to be successful at work but it's around education that we're most excited to see. We've got now 1,500 children in uh, our charter school that serves as the anchor of the education pipeline, 1,500 people, um, one of the highest performing schools in the state. So this is the model that you will see Kurt and his team talk about. In a defined neighborhood, investing in three key strategies, mixed income housing, a cradle to college education pipeline, and community wellness. And the, the secret to their success, though, is going to be leadership. The leaders that you have here today are, have formed what we call a, a lead organization, a new nonprofit whose sole reason for existence is to make sure all the partners who are necessary to implement all this complicated work do it in a coordinated and effective way. We're really excited about it. We think this is something that is, can happen all over the country. Purpose Built Communities now supports 10 other organizations around the country, just like uh, Northside Development Corporation. We're dancing with 20 more. And I will say, it's people like you guys who are the leaders, who are the change agents, who stand up and say, 
I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore, and there's a way that we can do something about it. And if any of you'd like to talk to me about that later, I'd be happy to entertain your questions. Um, but thank you. Really, I uh, enjoy being here and look forward to our panel discussion. All right. We're going to go really... There we go. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carol. The, that East Lake story is really one of just tremendous accomplishment, Herculean effort on the part of so many people there in Atlanta. And if anybody's ever been there, uh, and, and I saw it uh, before the development, you would never recognize uh, the look, the place, the feel, everything. It's been completely transformed, which shows you that, yes, it can happen. And you know, that one stat that Carol brought up about uh, literacy, third graders, not being, if you live in concentrated poverty and the inability to read a grade level in third grade, 86%, I'll remind you that we brought that stat out a couple of weeks ago. There's a quarter million kids in South Carolina living in concentrated poverty, quarter million. Quarter million. And if you're a parent like me, raising a first grader and a kindergartner, it breaks your heart sometimes to go into some of these low-income schools where I present on a regular basis. It's part of my job, community outreach, and walk away knowing that that classroom, most of those kids with all that hope and all those eyes full of um, brightness that you saw up there in the screen, knowing deep down that they're going to have a tough road to make it. That's one of the reasons why this is such an important initiative for all of us. I want to introduce you to Kurt McPhail, president of Green Lab Strategies, which specializes in providing innovative solutions to community de development projects locally and also around the world. Currently, McPhail leads Green Lab's work as executive staff for Global Bike Inc., a nonprofit connecting people to resources with bikes, and the Northside Development Corporation, a nonprofit implementing Spartanburg's most ambitious redevelopment ever. Green Lab is also managing the Mary Black Foundation's Northside Investment Portfolio. They combine over 15 years of nonprofit, foundation, community engagement, and international solution finding skills to bring a fresh and innovative perspective to every single opportunity. Please welcome Mr. Kurt McPhail. I just want to echo what Carol said about how exciting it is to be here tonight and in particularly uh, to be here with my friends from uh, the journey that we're on in Northside. Um, I will tell you, I never envy following Carol at anything we talk about. So um, uh, it, it's always exciting to hear her passion and talk about our uh, journey to replicate the great work in um, in, in Eastlake. I want to talk to you about what Mark said is Spartanburg's most ambitious redevelopment plan ever. Um, we have, uh, this, is, this is our canvas that we're working with. Um, this is 400 acres. Um, it's one of the largest, if not the largest redevelopment effort in the purpose-built network. Um, and one that often people say, why in the heck are you looking at 400 acres? Um, because it makes sense. Uh, a personal story. Um, I cut my teeth professionally as a community organizer here uh, after graduating from Wofford College in 1996. Um, I could go through all of the stats uh, that, that Carol talked about for communities that find themselves uh, with challenges, um, but, but ours is very similar to what you heard of Eastlake. But what I want you to leave here tonight with is a sense of hope. Um, and excitement, because I can tell you that the residents of Northside, far back, decades, have been a community that have stood up for what's right, uh, have been a community that has believed in themselves to create a different outcome, and is one now more focused than ever on becoming uh, one of the success stories, not only in the purpose-built network, uh, but across the country. Um, I first met Carol Naughton some almost 15 years ago uh, when new mayor Bill Barnett, who couldn't be with us tonight and sends his regrets, uh, sent me on a chase to figure out what she was doing in Atlanta that was so good. Um, and I left there uh, thinking that, that Mr. Cousins had bought the East Lake Golf Club. And I came back to Bill and said, Bill, we got to figure out where's our golf course? Where's our golf course? Just like East Lake. Um, well, a couple of years ago, um, metaphorically, we received our golf course. And if you look in the front part of this picture, on the grounds of the former Spartan Mill textile site sits the Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine. 
Now, if we all did a poll and said, we've got this community that's 65% poverty by federal standards, um, you know, 46% vacant, uh, what kind of ideas do you all have for community development? And one of you raised your hand and said, you know what, let's build a medical college right there in the middle of that neighborhood. We would have laughed you out the room, but that's what we, were, we inherited, this opportunity to have a $28 million medical university sat in the middle of our community. Our city leaders knew that this was an opportunity not to pass up, and our community knew that it was an opportunity for us all to come together and work. I will say that the partnerships we've created in Northside rival any, um, and you'll see that represented on the panel tonight. Uh, Northside Development Group, this is our new name. Uh, we just changed it. We're a group of people passionate about bringing Spartanburg's Northside to its well-deserved potential. We're investing time, skills, and dollars. It takes all of that and much more to ensure a safe, strong, and thriving Northside community. In our panel, you'll hear about that. If you don't know about Northside um, or, or why in the city of Spartanburg, let me tell you a couple of things. You've heard about the Edward via College of Osteopathic Medicine. You'll learn a little bit about Wofford College, uh, which is just one block away. You'll hear a little bit in a minute about Spartanburg Medical uh, Center, which is two blocks away. You'll hear a little bit about Cleveland Academy of Leadership, one of the best public schools in the state of South Carolina and is doing amazing things and you'll hear from their leader uh, tonight. Uh, Cleveland Park is also right there, um, but also we're two blocks from downtown. So this area is close to everything and surrounded by strategic partners. So how do we do it? What is it that we do? And there's so much, but tonight I wanted to focus on, on a couple of things. When we started this, we knew we had to have land uh, because we didn't want to go through a process where we dreamed up beautiful things and didn't have anything to build it on. So we knew we needed land, we needed partnerships, and we also needed to do what we say we were gonna do. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is a, 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 the same picture you saw, but just sort of from above. Every piece of uh, property that you see circled in a color on that screen is currently owned by the Northside Development Group or the city of Spartanburg. And we've done that strategically. We've also done it without mis displacing anyone. One family chose to move. We bought three houses out of 175 that were occupied and only one of those no longer uh, resides in Northside. Now we did this by collecting capital and going out ahead of time and purchasing property because we knew we wanted that. So land acquisition was critical. Uh, partnerships was all. This is a wonderful picture. You'll meet Tony Thomas in just a minute, one of my heroes. Um, this is a conversation like many that we have with a diverse group of people around the table just a city councilwoman, city manager, city attorney, all sitting behind a group of residents looking at a map, talking about how do we make Northside safe, strong, and thriving. Partnerships with the community are, are key to the work we do. Um, we started this project and said we wanted to do it with residents and not to them. Um, we've all heard of and, and in my career have been involved in community development projects that really did things to communities. Uh, we want to do it with, and this is an example, so partnerships are, are really important. Doing what we say we're going to do is, if not the most important thing. Um, one of the things the residents talked about in their vision statement was the need for new housing. We had the opportunity to partner with the local uh, housing authority uh, to build what we call our model block. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that when we ask residents what they wanted the housing to look like, the key thing they said is they want it to look like it's been there for a while. Well, this is an old mill community. Did anybody else, anybody grow up in a mill community? If you remember, a lot of the houses had two front doors. So, so our developers decided to build duplexes so that it looks like that and honors our community wishes. Uh, these hopefully will be rented out um, to, to those folks on public housing with the opportunity that they can buy their unit uh, within the next two months. Um, one, of the, one of the things that this area is also is a food desert. There's nowhere to buy fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, at a community meeting four years ago, uh, a resident raised their hand and said, you know what, the ice cream truck has no, uh, no, no challenges coming into our community selling ice cream to our youth. Um, wouldn't it be nice if a vegetable truck came and actually sold vegetables to us? 
um, uh, organization took that note to heart, worked with some residents and developed a mobile farmer's market that's now delivered over 10,000 pounds of fresh food around Spartanburg County. Uh, residents of Northside said that's great for it to come through and deliver vegetables every now and then, but we want a facility that works full time. Uh, Harvest Park is that facility. If you see up in the beginning is the drawing conceptually. Uh, the next picture is our urban farm that's currently producing vegetables to be sold. Um, the farmer's market pavilion right here and in the bottom panoramic picture to your far left, you'll see a retail space that will house a commercial kitchen that the community can rent out and also will be a place where folks can get prepared foods and fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, it's really about saying uh, what we want to do, listening to the community and helping them make it happen. And we're excited to be a part of this. Um, Cleveland Academy of Leadership is a special place. Um, point blank. And it's critical to this. As Carol mentioned, one of the fundamentals is cradle to, uh, cradle to career education. Uh, we could be no more pleased to work with Cleveland Academy of Leadership. Um, it is the only public school in the state of South Carolina that goes 205 days, um, and they make special provisions and go into their budget to do that. Um, if you wanted to know whether or not it works, this slide tells you. Um, they scored 39.6 in 2012. Um, and in 2013, they scored a 68.2. Um, in many situations, we don't celebrate these. Uh, Dr. Wood will tell you I did while I was at Wofford, and we're going to celebrate this one because there's a heck of a lot of improvement between those two. And that improvement alone, thank you. Thank you, Russell. That improvement alone won Cleveland Academy of Leadership the Palmetto Silver Award. Um, so what's the plan for Northside? Carol's already stolen this slide from me. It's mixed income, uh, uh, mixed income housing, cradle to career education, and high quality social services. These are some drawings from our master plan. Tony and, and the rest of the folks from the neighborhood led uh, a weekend charrette or neighborhood planning workshop where over 300 folks came in and gave their vision. They said, we want to see parks like this on our main street that have art in them so we can play and experience art. They actually came up with this new term called an artlet. And we are actually applying uh, for, for a federal grant to create artlets all through Northside. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, Greenville has its Reedy River. Um, Northside has the Butterfly Creek. Um, this is a creek that for years has been known as the Nasty Branch. Um, the, re the, the students at Cleveland renamed it Butterfly Branch. Um, and hopefully soon uh, we'll get word that uh, through a different project, we'll be able to daylight Butterfly Creek and create a beautiful linear park. Um, Housing, mixed income, uh, the community wants something, as I said earlier, that looks like it's been here a while. That's the concept of our plan. Um, and I, again, am super excited to be on uh, uh, this stage tonight, but also even more excited uh, to share the stage with the panelists that you're going to meet in just a second. OK, so you've had a chance to meet Kurt and Carol and listen to them for a second. Let me introduce you to everybody else who's going to join us up on stage. Tony, say hello to everybody. Hello. How's Tony Thomas, long time resident of Spartanburg, uh, been a very dedicated community leader, current president of the Northside Neighborhood Association and founding member of the Northside Voyagers. What is the Northside Voyagers? Well, the Northside Voyagers is a group of individuals. There's seven of us now, and we were put together to help facilitate the transformation. And our motto is to transform, transcend, and triumph. And that's what we're trying to do. And um, we're there to help the community with um, information concerning the redevelopment efforts and to be that liaison, you know. It's, it's, it's easier when you have someone in the community working with you than someone from the outside coming in. No question. That's what we Thanks do. for being here, Tony. Somebody that I know very well, Russell Booker, who's the superintendent of schools in uh, Spartanburg, District 7. Uh, Russell, I've known you for a long time. I admire your passion. I admire your enthusiasm for your community. Uh, Russell has been superintendent for quite a while. He's guided the district and community through a bold, comprehensive restructuring and transformation that has positioned the district for future growth and innovation. And Russell, just tell us a little bit about this recent technology initiative called Seven Ignites, because that sounds right. pretty exciting. Yeah, happy to tell you about it. Um, one of the things we know with our students, there is an achievement gap. And there's an achievement gap between the students who uh, come from uh, middle-class families and students who come from poverty. 
Uh, with the onset of technology, one of the things we're seeing now is that gap is starting to widen because what we'll find, many of our children, when they go home, they still have these resources. I have a seventh grader and I have a fifth grader. And when they don't know something or when mom and I can't help them with that algebra, we've got a place to go now. Well, what's happening so often, many of our kids don't have a place to go. So there is a digital divide now among our kids. So one of the things we decided to do at the school district was to eliminate that digital divide. So in Spartanburg 7 now, all of our students uh, in grades 3 through 5 have an iPad. All of our students in grades 6 through 12 have a MacBook Air laptop. Uh, our students at Cleveland, through the work of this Northside Development Corporation and Purpose Built, uh, they paid additional funds for those children to have a laptop to go home. So that's the moral imperative. The other part is changing how we teach and learn in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to talk about blended learning and what that means to education a little later on. Sure. Let me introduce you to the man to the right of Russell there. That's Phil Fazal, who has been the chief executive officer of Spartanburg Regional Health Systems Pelham Medical Center in Greer since 2009. Previously, the executive vice president of business performance for Bon Secours St. Francis Health System and was president of the former Allen Bennett Memorial Hospital. And Phil, let me just ask you how you got involved in this whole Northside initiative. Well, the Spartanburg Regional Healthcare System, um, and, and as Kurt mentioned, our campus sits, our main campus, the Spartanburg Medical Center campus sits within blocks of the north side. And uh, at Spartanburg Regional, we have pillars that are foundational to the work that we're doing, uh, strategic pillars. And, and uh, you know, those, as you might expect, are based on quality and patient engagement and on uh, financial outcome, business growth. But we have a pillar fa uh, that, that our board is a uh, uh, approved, which is improve community health. And there's many ways we do that. One of those that's very important to us is uh, engaging with the local community um, from this concept of, uh, of not just the health care, but the, mm -hmm. the socioeconomic determinants of health that are so critical um, to, to the things that make a person healthy. And so we have committed uh, both institutionally um, but also individually, uh, a number of folks on our executive committee, our executive group, have committed their time and, 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 and talents to working on the Northside Project on a variety of, uh, of the uh, groups that are working. And last but not least, uh, Dr. David Wood, Senior Vice President for Development at Wofford. His previous position at the school prior to July 1st was that of provost, so he is close to the academic and service learning connections incorporated into what's going on in the Northside Initiative. Dr. Wood, uh, Wofford is this beautiful bucolic campus. I mean, you couldn't ask for a, a better setting in a university environment. It almost seems so serene that it's impossible to, in my mind, mix what goes on on that beautiful campus with what you had seen previously in the Northside community. Uh, institutionally, at what point did Wofford decide that we had better become engaged with what's going on in our back door? You know, we've been engaged with the North Side for, for decades, off and on. Uh, various classes and entities doing projects. Started a math academy out of our math department 10 years ago at Cleveland Academy. But this gave us a chance to really leverage that. I, I think we were even a little frustrated. Our kind of places, uh, Furman, the Woffords of the world, uh, our, our DNA contains this commitment to citizen education, involvement, uh, participation, and uh, our ways of trying to do that have really been enhanced and leveraged. Uh, 18,000 hours since 2005 by one report I have by Wofford students put into the North Side, but not necessarily being as productive as I think it, it now is. So, But let's face it, you're talking mostly students at, uh, at Wofford College. You grew up in a very privileged background for the most part, and for them to contribute in that way, I would imagine you've probably heard some fairly enriching stories. Absolutely. In fact, we had a, the charrette that was mentioned, uh, a class in the month of January. We're on a 414 calendar, and they spent the entire month with Kurt and others. It was a transformative experience for them to, to devote 40 hours a week for four weeks uh, digging into this project, uh, working with the neighborhood residents and, and all components of it. So it's been pretty powerful on our campus in terms of its impact. Kurt, I want to ask you something. I see the mission statement up there for the Northside Initiative. Right. I'm a big fan of mission statements because right. I think they keep you true to your cause. Uh, but you had underlined there 
uh, well-deserved potential. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that was selected in a, in a very purposeful way. Right, right. Um, you know, my, as I mentioned earlier, my, my history with the North Side goes back some uh, almost 20 years now. Um, and I think if you look at, and, and Tony and I had a, a rich conversation about this, if you look at the history uh, of Northside, um, it, it has missed out on its due uh, time and time again. Um, whether developments, you know, with the, with the mill, when the mill left, um, other, other ideas that came in. I began work there because Northside was the most violent uh, community in the city's history. Um, had, had really struggled when the mill left, investors came in and bought up the old mill houses, uh, a transient population uh, combined with downturn in the economy uh, added to with the prevalence of crack cocaine in inner city communities was a recipe for disaster in the north side. You know, that said, residents like Tony and others were still making their voices heard, uh, but the institution uh, sort of engagement wasn't at the level that we see uh, today. And that's, you know, from, from all different levels. And it, it wasn't, um, you know, so it is, it's a well-deserved potential that everyone deserves. And I think communities like Northside, um, East Lake, and others, um, it's their time. And I think as, as the model that Carol talks about and, and what we try and do by bringing uh, um, sort of the, uh, uh, the partners to the table, you know, we've talked often that it's in Tony's best interest for Northside to be better. Uh, it's in Russell's best interest for Northside to be better. It's in Phil's best interest for North, and it's in David's best, you know, it's in all of our collective mm -hmm. best interest. Mm -hmm. And I think for the first time, we finally got like Carol mentioned earlier, everybody's on the same page we're not scared to say that, you know what, if Northside's successful, you know, Wofford's a huge win. You know, that, that's a great idea for parents coming to bringing students there to see that. Um, from a community health standpoint, having um, Phil's borders much more healthy and much more sustainable as a community is great. So uh, long answer to your question, it's well-deserved um, and, and, you know, and it's their time. I think it's an excellent choice of words though, because especially when you talk about young people, all of them have potential, as we've seen from Carol's slide. Look what happened at East Lake and the education outcomes that have changed over the last 10 years. Right. goes to show you with the right opportunity that potential can be maximized. Tony, let's go back to the genesis uh, of this great story, because I would imagine that you were probably barking in people's ear for a long time, that you were probably nagging city officials for every chance you got. Yeah. What can we do about my neighborhood? How can we change this place that I live in, this place that I love? How can we make it better? I don't imagine that those conversations all started off as pleasant as this right here. No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, there were times when we had a lot of difficulties going on yeah. in the neighborhood, and, and a lot of the residents felt like they didn't have a voice or that no one heard what they were saying. So, you know, we had to first establish with the city and the people who it made a difference to and who can make a difference that there were people in that community who cared and who wanted change and who, who deserved it. And um, when they started to realize that, you know, we weren't going to shut up, then they <laughs> came on board. Does this go back to that idea of following through, doing what you say you are going to do? We find that in communities like this, there's an awful lot of suspicion mm -hmm. of authority. There's suspicion mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. institutions that have been around for a long time. And that, well, you know, I believe it when I see it. Right. Was there a lot of that? Well, well, yeah, you know, anytime you have a community like ours, you know, um, depressed in, in the way that it is and, and has been, it's changing now, you know, you have people who don't believe and they say, well, we've seen this before in other communities and, you know, they're not going to, they're just going to come in here and move us out and mm -hmm. do what they do. So we had to, you know, let them know that this was an opportunity for them to take advantage of the opportunity to have partners in the community that were going to come in and work with them and work with us to have something that we wanted to have and to make a difference, and that we could be a contributing factor to the city instead of someone you know, or, or a community that wasn't giving back as much as it was receiving. Carol, if you could, can you backtrack a little bit and, and talk about what you believe to be the driving force that really ignited what happened in East Lake? I mean, was it a coalition of people? Mm -hmm. Was it a couple of giants in the community who said this is something that has to be done? Does it sound similar to what's happening in Spartanburg? There's a lot of similarities. Um, the, one of the similarities, I think, is that everybody thought we were crazy when we first started. And, and it's good. You want to be underestimated. Um, and it's good for people to think that, you know, you, you're not going to be able to do 
do what you say you're going to do yeah. because they kind of stay out of your way and they don't try to sabotage your work. And frankly, that was the case in Eastlake with, with Tom Cousins and Renee Glover and Eva Davis. Nobody ever believed that the three of them would be able to agree on a plan to move forward. In fact, Jimmy Carter, who uh, had uh, tried to work in the Eastlake neighborhood when he started the Atlanta Project, advised Tom Cousins to go home. He said, I have brokered peace between Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, and we will never <laughs> see peace between Tom Cousins and Eva Davis. And it is hmm. to Tom Cousins and Eva Davis's credit that they kept on keeping on. They kept on negotiating. They kept on getting to a place until they, as Miss Davis said, he just had to get to know me and I just had to get to know him and figure that out, that what they really wanted were the same things. And once they've built that relationship, we were able to move forward. And I've seen that same thing happen in Spartanburg and in other communities. Russell, I'll come back to you in a moment, but Phil, let me ask you yes, the, about these strategic partnerships that are necessary in order to transform a neighborhood. Uh, how difficult is it for institutions to put their own self-interest aside, because maybe yours don't completely align with North Side, or sit at a table with folks who may have differing visions for how this should turn out and how this should look. You know, forming those partnerships is one thing, keeping them together, moving in the right direction would seem to be entirely another. Yeah, I think uh, this has been very easy. This is this for for us uh, recognizing that the leadership uh, and 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 uh, like Kurt, I'm sorry that Bill Barnett was not with us this evening. I mean, mm -hmm. he really has been a driving force, and and and, and as he came to our organization and said, I really want you to, to to participate in what's going on in the North Side. It was very easy for us to say yes. Um, I, you know, healthcare is changing as dramatically as any industry. Uh, in, in America today, and, and it will continue to. And, and and we recognize from a healthcare perspective. I'm getting a little granular on on some of our thinking, but this this concept of population health is is where we're all headed, right? And everybody has different ideas of what that is, but but in, in, in essence, it it is taking care of, of populations, of communities, of subgroups. Um, uh, for their entire health care, not just when they are sick and come to the hospital. We recognize today in healthcare that we need non-provider partners to do that. I, I think for the longest time in healthcare, we thought well, we'll, we'll kind of cradle the grave, try to take care of that. Well, that's not the case any longer. And, and, and so the recognition that, that we need to be in the community. I mean, as Carol presented some of the some of the things that were going on in, in East Lake, we, we certainly acknowledge them in, in the North Side as well. You know, if folks have issues with housing, if they're concerned about safety, if they're concerned about education, about where their meals are going to come from. They're not thinking about their health care. I mean, those again, those socioeconomic mm -hmm. determinants of health are so important today. Obviously, heredity uh, plays a part, but we realize today that that's critical, and we can't do that alone. And, yeah. and, and so, uh, you know, again, recognizing that this is our greater neighborhood. Um, we walk around the corner, and we are in the north side, and, and, and we've got employees that live in the north side. We've got folks that are part of that working poor who have had long history there. And, and so we feel it's a very important important um, opportunity for us, mm -hmm. and we, we look at it as an opportunity to, to, to better this, this greater community. Carol, you had something to add? Yeah, I, th I think one of the most exciting things that I have learned in the last five years is around health. If you had asked me five years ago whether I was in the health business, I would have said absolutely not because I conflated health with medical care. Mm -hmm. And if you had asked David five years ago, or Phil, I'm sorry, Phil five years ago, whether he was in the community development business, he would have said, oh, no, I am in the health business. Right. But what we have come to learn is that those two things are so fundamentally connected that if, you know, what, 30% of your health outcomes are tied to your genes, 10%, just 10% of your health outcome is tied to the quality of the medical care you receive. 60% of your health outcome is tied to your, so, your environment and your behavior. And environment and behavior are the things that we are all collectively going to impact. So we in the community development world mm -hmm. are in fact creating communities that value health that will make, frankly, better use of the resources associated with medical care. Which are limited. Yeah. But which goes back to that whole notion that it has to be holistic. Right. Exactly. Right. 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 Russell, let me ask you a little bit about that technology. Yeah. Um, young people, uh, they don't live in a hole where they don't know what's going on around other places. You know, they're not blind to uh, other school districts, other schools. I'll give you an example. I spent a week in Williamsburg County earlier um, mm -hmm. this winter with a lot of high school students there. It's, it's an impoverished county, a persistent poverty county. 
once they realized I was from Columbia, the one question that they really asked me more than any other was, have you seen that new River Bluff High School in oh, yeah. Columbia? Which is just this amazing facility located in Lexington, which is a pretty high-income county. Uh, and it's a fabulous place. It's wonderful. But they had all seen this, and they were looking around going, that is not our reality. And they know it's not fair. They feel it's not fair. They don't have access to technology like these other kids do. Uh, do you, did you have that sense looking at their kids, looking at your kids, let's say, in Spartanburg 7, that they had a sense that maybe things weren't as fair as they might ought to be? Uh, not necessarily. Cleveland is a beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. uh, we built the school in 2001. Um, so the resources were abundant at the school. Uh, you, know, you saw some information about test scores. We didn't go into Cleveland with the notion that we've just got to change test scores. Our mission isn't to get good test scores. Our mission is to produce successful, productive citizens. That's the bottom line. And one of the things we knew we had to do at Cleveland was change the culture. So that's what our focus has been on. Cleveland is now a leadership academy. That was one of the first things we instituted at the school. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a leader in me school, which is based on Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. Being proactive, beginning with the end in mind, thinking win-win, synergizing, all of those things that work for us in the business community, they work for young people as well. So that was the first thing we had to do. Uh, I had a superior court judge at Cleveland this past Friday. She drove in from Charlotte. She had heard about the school and wanted to see it. The thing that I'm most proud of at Cleveland isn't the bar graph you showed a second ago. It's when young ladies and young boys come to the door, hand out, <laughs> eye contact, welcoming you to their school. It's when you walk into that school and you see that spark in the children's eyes. That wasn't always there. They didn't have that that belief. It's when you walk into classrooms now when you see true student engagement. Mm -hmm. This is a journey. You're going to see the test scores go mm -hmm. up and they're going to go down and they'll go up and up and up. Then they may go down some. But the culture is where things had to begin and that's what's changed. We've seen enrollment go from 373 students to 550. Now that's adding five weeks to the school year. You know, <laughs> you would think everybody would bail out. But the parents want that. The students want that. So Absolutely. I just want you to know that's been our primary focus is building on the culture first. And that's where we're seeing our greatest success. Interesting. Kurt, let me ask you this. You know, uh, getting people leader in leadership positions in the community to pull one direction right. like this, that's your first hurdle, right? right? The next hurdle it would seem to be would be to gather and generate community support. Mm -hmm. uh, that would seem to be a more difficult step uh, at large because a lot of folks would say, well, you know, not my problem. Not right. my neighborhood. Yeah. How does it affect me? What What have you encountered in community conversations about the initiative? You know, I think, um, and we often say this when we're we're meeting with areas, in particular in Spartanburg County, that um, Northside isn't alone. There are lots of former mill communities, probably in Greenville County, just like there are in Spartanburg County, that are suffering just like uh, Northside. Um, what we often say, though, is with the partnerships and the resources and the development of the medical college, if we can't figure out Northside with all of that and the community support, we might as well give up and call it a day. Um, our hope is to create a model that other communities, not only around the upstate, but around the country can look at to see, you know, it's important to engage the residents first and foremost. And I'll just tell a quick story. Mm -hmm. As we went around and we spent just, just, you know, what you see up here is sort of the fruits of about three and a half to four years worth of conversations mm -hmm. and getting people together. So not that that took this group of people that long to come on board, but it was that important to us to create some foundational understanding of what we all wanted. Um, and when we had vision sessions, um, on in the neighborhood at Cleveland and we talk to residents across the board we want safety we want better housing and we want opportunities for our young people mm -hmm. and when we talk to other community partners outside of the community what do you think might do great in Northside better housing a clean and safe neighborhood and opportunities for our young people and so one of the things that's been astounding with us is we bring folks in from the outside whether they're architects or developers and they talk with Phil and David and they talk with Tony and the Voyagers, 
they hear the same story. And it's shocking that, wow, the greater community and the neighborhood all want the same thing. Um, now, I will also say, and, and you mentioned it earlier with Tony, um, the work that we did and the time we invested in building support and understanding from a resident level uh, and, and Tony's group called the Voyagers who named themselves and it's the best name in the world was invaluable. And, and Tony is right. Tony and I can go into a room and this has happened and it can be a room of the community. And we say, Hey, you know, what kind of rumors are out there? What are you worried about? And I ask it and the room is dead quiet. Everybody's <laughs> shaking their head. And I go sit down and Tony gets up right behind and says, all right, what kind of rumors, what are you worried about? And I can't write fast okay. enough on this. And, and that is just a, a, a quick analogy that this is so important to have community leadership mm -hmm. because Tony and all the others are going to be the one that live in Northside. And as we create a community of choice, we hope a lot of other people will choose to move there. Uh, but, but it's about sustainability and it's about health and it's about making it last for a long time. Well, Can Tony, you, yeah, please. What I'd like to add to that is um, when we first, um, you know, endeavored to do this, I got involved because of the, the lack of food, fresh food and vegetables in our community. And um, I was willing to put on the broccoli suit and get on TV and advertise. <laughs> so I did that. But um, There's a picture of that somewhere. That's a community leader for you right there. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and we did that and we got it and the people are taking advantage of it. But um, after we decided to get on board as the Voyagers with uh, the North Side Redevelopment Group, the first thing we did in our community was have a meeting where we, you know, wanted to assess the community skills and assets. And, and we had people come in. We, 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 we established a form for them to fill out. And, and, and it include all the information that they needed to, you know, to let us know what their skills and their assets, what their skill sets were and what the assets they had. So that eventually sometime in the future, we can use that database to go back and, and help them get employment. Take an you inventory. Know, right, exactly. What we have in the community, because there are a lot of people there that have a lot of skills and a lot of abilities that are just untapped. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of them don't have the, the, um, the self-esteem enough to say, hey, I can do this. They don't feel that they're worthy. So we had to go out to the community and say, listen, you know, we want to know what you can do. Where are your skill sets? I don't care if you bake, uh, you do yard work. What are your skill sets? And, and we want to use that as a database for the future. Do you have this sense at this point, given where the organization is now, that you have turned a corner that the majority of people that you speak to in the neighborhood have that sense of hope finally? Or is there still a measure of... Mm, well, it you know, might work out, it might not. At the beginning, we did, of course, but now they're starting to see the changes. You know, um, we're not just mean? talking. We're doing, like Chris they, said, we have to do what we say we're doing. If they begin to feel it, how does that change manifest itself? Well, it manifests itself in lower crime rates, first of all. Mm -hmm. Our people are safer. We have lower crime rates. Our crime rates are going, they're just dropping. You know, the police reports. We have our uh, monthly meetings, uh, neighborhood association meetings, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a police officer that serves our community, our, our you know, our, community uh, officer and our crime rates are just dropping every month they're lower and lower and and the community is starting to see that and they're the ones who are perpetrating the crimes are usually not the people that live there there are people who come in from other places and they you know, we call it I call them interlopers and uh, you know for lack of a better term I could say a lot of things but right. you know they're interlopers. <laughs> they, they, they don't belong there so we tell them, you know these are these people live in the community have been here, some of them for 20, 30 years or more, and they don't deserve that. So we mm -hmm. need the police and, and our cooperation with the police to come in and help us clean this thing up. So we're seeing that because the people are seeing the changes with the new food hub. They're seeing the changes with, you know, all the things that are going on with the schools, the, mm -hmm. the college, Walford, and the students are involved over the community now. They're, they're more involved in what we're doing. We have a reading program that the students of Walford are helping us to establish and set up the standards standards for and it's all working really good and we see the results because the crime rate is going down we have new people moving into the community buying up homes Which that, that are available right and they're fixing them up making them livable making them re really beautiful homes to stay in so those are the kind of changes that we know are making a difference right. and we can we can measure that and Russell what does that mean for young people in the community we've talked an awful lot about uh, the working poor and adults what that means to them we've touched upon the effects that it has on young people do they get a lift out of knowing that people are investing emotionally, spiritually, financially in that community? Oh, not just the students. It's the students. It's the teachers. Uh, you know, there was a Which time. Which are vitally important as well. They have to be on board, too. There was a time when being a teacher at Cleveland wasn't glamorous. And now <laughs> they love to teach at Cleveland. Uh, we set foundations up for the schools. Uh, people have 
you know, set money aside, not for professional development, but I just want you to treat your teachers in a special kind of way. So, you know, absolutely, that makes How a world of difference. That? What do you demand from them? Uh, people want to see success. You know, Jim Collins talks about that flywheel. And once that flywheel gets turning, people want to get on board. Our challenge right now, there's so many people wanting to get on board, which is a great thing. The Mary Black Foundation has even given us a grant. We've hired a community partnerships person for the school now. Not many schools can say that. But, um, you know, momentum makes a world of difference. So our goal is to keep putting those small successes out there in front of our students, in front of our teachers, in front of our community. Tony and these guys, they're coming into the schools now. We yeah. just wrote a letter of support for them. So um, it absolutely makes a difference. The healthier our schools, the healthier our communities, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it, it's reciprocal. Let me ask you, Carol, a, a personal question, I guess. You had made mention when you were speaking up here that you know, that move and being introduced to East Lake, you know, changed your career mm -hmm. professionally, obviously, but it also changed you personally. Uh, was there something about this, uh, this subject, say poverty, working poor, that perhaps maybe you hadn't given a whole lot of thought to until you were introduced to East Lake? Um, I had danced around a little bit um, and volunteered here and there, but I had never really immersed myself in a community other than my own. Um, and having a chance to build, having the luxury of time to build authentic relationships um, and get to know people and, and be challenged and tested and passed sometimes and failed other times by given mm -hmm. another chance. I mean, all of that was really important. And in the, the planning process of Eastlake and then other public housing revitalizations in Atlanta um, really changed kind of how I looked at the world. And um, I think really uh, honed a sense of social justice that had not been um, had not been as, as sharp as it should have been. I went to law school because like so many other people my age, I wanted to be like Atticus Finch. Um, yeah. you know, who, who was yes, like the, the, like the coolest, well, you know, one of the coolest people on the planet. I mean, he was, you know, this, did everything that was right. Um, and, and I wanted to do that and I had never found myself tested. And, um, and so moving to work at the housing authority and getting involved in this community development world, um, gave me a chance not just to talk the talk, but walk the walk. And I'm, I fail more often than I succeed. Um, but I have built relationships that are really deeply meaningful and authentic and have changed my life, changed the, the lives, I think, of my children. Um, for example, my son is, wants to be a teacher at a Title I school. He's in Send graduate school. Send them all. Um, and my, <laughs> my daughter is in public health. Um, both of these things that I think come out of this work. So, yeah, it's changed a lot. Hey, let me ask you, Phil, very quickly here about uh, your personal connection to this. Has it changed your view of this subject well, about poverty, the conversation about the working poor? It, it has. I, you know, I, I will. Um, I will tell you, the the day I got involved with the North Side was a day Kurt, uh, Kurt and I were both cyclists, and he said, "Jump on your bike. Let's let's go." I was really new to Spartanburg. <laughs> I've been working at the Pelham campus, but I but I moved down to working at the Spartanburg main campus. And he said, let's go, I want you to ride through this neighborhood and see what's going on and, and see the change. And it really took 30 minutes in an afternoon for, uh, for me to say, I want to be involved personally, not just institutionally. I want to get involved with what's going on here. Um, there, there was great opportunity and, and continues to be, you know, as, as Tony's talking about the change that is occurring on the inside right now. And, and, and it is marked. I mean, there are things going on. It, it, it's, it's, as we talk about the schools and, and and what's going on there, there's still the greater Spartanburg community that doesn't see a lot of yeah. that. Plenty of articles in the paper, but but it's not a neighborhood you really drive through. It's bound right. by the railroad on one side, a, a, a very busy Church Street on, on the other side, fairgrounds. And so there really needed to be, and I think we've kind of hit that just mm -hmm. recently, the, 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 the city, north side, Wofford, Spartan Regional came together to to purchase a, a, a for lack of a better term a derelict hotel that that sat on Church Street right across from his campus right across from our hospital to say let's let's move that out of there let's 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 make a big difference and a splash frankly and, and it, it is the kind of splash that need to be made we really have huge, huge. Pine Street almost between Dr Woods campus and our hospital in the north side is is a barrier. I'm sorry, Church Street is a barrier, um, and we don't cross it a whole lot. And there, there have been reasons for that. It's, it's a very difficult street to cross from a pedestrian perspective anyway. 
but but we are taking down this right. sunshine in, and, and it took a financial commitment from yes. all these. And, and so folks in the neighborhood are very appreciative. Oh, yes. But it's a symbol <laughs> oh, to the yes. whole of the community that things are going on, oh, yeah. that I'll drive yeah. into the north side to see what's going on now. When the food hub opens, that's going to be dramatic. I mean, I've seen that work and some of the work I've done in Greenville. I've seen what can happen when when thing, when the Ray Kroc Center opens up in, in, in the Greenville neighborhood that opened up and how things change. It, 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 people start going to places that they haven't gone previously. And so we've got that opportunity here. Mm -hmm. Well, Kirk, well, let me ask you, Kirk, real quickly here uh, about that financial aspect and investing mm -hmm. in these communities. Right. When you go to city leaders, people uh, who are deeply involved in business in the community, was there some reaction by some folks? I mean, I would look at pictures of that and go, that's going to cost an awful lot of money, and I don't know where we're going to get that. Uh, was that a subject that had to be broached along the way? You know, it's interesting when, um, and again, we keep going back to, to, to Bill um, and Bill Barnett, and, and, and there's very few people that could raise uh, $2 million uh, without a plan or without anything other than saying, you know what, this is what you mm -hmm. should do. Um, and one of those individuals is Bill Barnett. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, I, I'll say this. When I came back from Eastlake 12 years ago, um, I, 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 the one thing that struck me was when Carol talked about Mr. Cousins buying the Eastlake Golf Club. And what he did next was call everybody <clears throat> in his Rolodex to be a member of the Eastlake Golf right. Club. And what I took from that was Mr. Cousins was willing to risk everything, his reputation with mm -hmm. all his business associates mm -hmm. to, to finance this idea that things could be better than they were in Eastlake. Um, and that's almost exactly what Bill has mm -hmm. done. And someone who's in the South Carolina Business Hall of Fame and who could be doing anything else but to go and raise money for us. So... We are incredibly fortunate uh, that we haven't had that pushback yet. Um, and we continue to go back to partners like Wofford, who, you know, have invested in this. You know, everybody on this stage has invested in this work one way or the other, and a lot of them with, with significant amounts of resources. Um, and, uh, you know, it's about collective vision. It's about seeing momentum. It's, you know... As simple as it may be to tear down a hotel, and it's not really that simple, but that alone, as people drive by Church Street, really starts to trigger, hmm, things really are happening. And, you know, mm -hmm. it really starts to change the landscape. So um, for us, we've been very fortunate. And with that uh, fortunate comes, you know, that we have to pro we have to produce, <laughs> and, you know, and there is a, you know, it's not the pressure <coughs> of going to ask for money. It's the pressure of delivering yeah. and doing what we say we're going to do. Yeah. And with a team like this and many others, it's great because we, we keep each other accountable. You know, mm -hmm. community and us, different partners. Um, I think we have really authentic, you know, partnerships mm -hmm. and relationships where we can mm -hmm. go and say, hey, Russell, I, you know, we got to talk about this. What do you think? And, um, and those conversations aren't easy, uh, but when you're open to it and you understand that the goal here um, is not about us individually, but it's about all of us collectively, um, then that conversation mm -hmm. becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Give me a time frame, Tony, of what we might look at when we drive through Northside seven, eight years from now. I would imagine that this is a vision that will be ongoing probably for the rest of your life, but do you think that this vision will be somewhat fully realized by them? It's going to take some time, but um, we're looking forward to it. But um, And in seven years from now, I think when you walk through Northside and Cedar Spartanburg, You'll see parks, first of all, where children playing, elderly are there. You'll see uh, students intermingling with the community. Um, you'll see people walking, enjoying each other. We have a lot of facilities there. That hotel that was mentioned earlier, it was not only a physical barrier, but it was also a psychological barrier to the students at Walford coming over into the community mm -hmm. because they looked at North Church Street as the river, and they were told, don't cross that river. So with that, with that, that eyesore gone, you know, it's going to be a more welcoming invite to the students mm -hmm. coming into our community. And in seven years from now, you're going to see them coming to the food hub that you saw being built. They're going to be there, um, you, know, you know, intermingling with the neighborhood. You're going to see the Early Childhood Development Center. You're going to see, hopefully, a recreation center. 
that's going to be built, you know, on the on the on some land that's nearby. And there's going to be a lot of things going on. But what you what I want see, want people to see when they come to Northside is a all inclusive community, a community where there's everybody working together. We couldn't do this without partnerships. You know, our, we just didn't have the resources in our community. So when they come, they're going to see a, a village, you know, a, a beautiful village of people living together, working together, students, elderly, children being loved and cared for in our parks. Did you ever think you would see them? Um, not this soon. I, I knew that change <laughs> could happen, but I didn't know it was going to come this soon and, and, and at this pace because we have so many people involved and so many people on board with the change. So it's great. Well, each one of you in your own way are really doing heroic work. Uh, I mean, I know you're all committed to, to the task at hand. Nobody said it was easy, but I mean, this is a fantastic learning initiative for everybody around the state. Uh, this can happen in North Charleston. This can happen where I live in Columbia. This can happen in parts of Myrtle Beach. I mean, this state Absolutely. is an impoverished state and needs a lot of work and it needs a lot more great examples just like that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.